Make sure you guys hit the subscribe button if you guys are enjoying the content that we're throwing up. And uh, make sure you guys hit the like button if you enjoy the video. And yeah, let's begin. Okay, you know one of the best things about being a comic book YouTuber is you guys. You know, I've admitted in the past, I'm not super knowledgeable on Spawn, and I'm kind of learning about it as I go through it and I cover it. I covered Spawn issues, uh, the, the first section, right? So like the origin of Spawn, and then like the second part, and then like the origin of Angela. And then a lot of the guys were just like, no, Rob, like just go with Spawn number 154 and just read forward, right? Like just read Armageddon, basically. Like all you need to know is that Spawn, and Spawn, you know, Malboja basically ended up dying. Spawn ended up killing him. He was offered, you know, Malboja's place in hell spawn said no because he didn't want to be part of hell he wanted to do his own thing that's all you need to really worry about right just cover armageddon i promise you will not be disappointed man let me tell you something <laughs> Dude, this story is lit. It's amazing. <laughs> this is why I'm so glad I have you guys, right? Like, this is why I'm so glad that I have you guys. So you guys, like, when it comes to stuff that I'm not really familiar with, you guys can be like, no, Rob, go read this instead. So, so here's the thing. Give me suggestions on, like, Spawn and, like, other stories and other things that are not Marvel and DC. Give me suggestions about that kind of stuff because you guys seem to love it and I'd love to go check those things out, right? Like, I'm mostly just a Marvel DC guy, right? Like, I don't really dip my toe out of the waters. But nonetheless, you guys don't care about my stance on comics you guys are here for spawns war against heaven and hell <laughs> okay there are a couple things to know going into this right we already covered one of them that essentially malboja is no longer part of the picture right like he was killed and spawn issue number 100 and in his place came a guy named lord mammon i think is what his name was now mammon is one of the fallen ones and this will kind of be explained a little more as we get through this but the long and short of this is that when it came to the fallen ones in the in the spawn universe and i do not know how true this is to actual biblical storytelling but the idea was that when the war between between heaven and hell broke out that there were angels who supported God but chose not to fight and the result is that they were basically cast out of heaven but never actually sent to hell. Mammon is, seems to be the exception right he's one of the rulers of hell and he's more powerful than Malboja is. The other part of this is there's what's called the man of miracles and then there's Sam and Twitch. Now Sam and Twitch uh, are really kind of like the sidekicks of Spawn not in the sense of like Robin or anything like that you know Robin for Batman but insofar as like they're supporting characters in the story but Sam and Twitch in the 1990s were huge huge people loved sam and twitch right like they love the, like like the bickering that went on between the two of them and that kind of thing so eventually they spun out into their own series which was hugely popular i'm pretty sure i think it was it was like a massively popular series uh, but people loved sam and twitch the idea is that they're kind of detectives right so they basically help spawn out insofar as there are things going on out there and it's like okay spawn can't really figure it out on his own or they can provide him with information he couldn't readily get on his own different things like that now the man of miracles is ambiguous if you know who he is please do not tell anyone right i know who the man of miracles is we find out, but please do not tell anyone who the Man of Miracles is. But one of the first big instances of the Man of Miracles encountering Spawn was when he basically removed the kid named named uh, a kid named Chris. And the idea behind this is that Chris was uh, was essentially seemed to be some aspect of Spawn himself that could basically reach in and grab other personalities out of Spawn. Now, why he has those personalities and how he got them will be explained over the course of this video. But what we do here is really kind of jump into the meat and potatoes, right? Because you guys want to kind of get into this sort of thing. And one of the things Spawn establishes right off the bat is he is not an agent of heaven and he's not an agent of hell, right? He's not working with either force. And that's what makes things kind of interesting is because Todd McFarlane depicts the conflict between heaven and hell almost as like rival gangs. Each one's trying to take over the other's turf, right? Like the angels and, and heaven want to get rid of like the forces of evil and the forces of evil want to get rid of like heaven and, and all the angels and God and all that kind of stuff, you know? And so they're sort of always warring against each other. Spawn, after the death of Malboja and the power that he possessed following that, basically put him in a position to where both sides were jockeying to get him to their side, right? Because of the power he possesses and what it is that he can do. And so because of that, he's kind of like, I don't want to have anything to do with this anymore, right? Like I'm doing my own thing. I'm not fighting for either side. And so the result of this is that he's basically given, you know, in, in an attempt to essentially stop the apocalypse, stop the end times from coming, he's given these kind of locations by Sam and Twitch about things that are popping off. Now, what they say is most of these skirmishes are being dealt with by like local police, but there are some that are exceedingly bad and things are kind of going nuts. And so the result of this is we end up jumping to basically Joshua Creek, Tennessee. What we have here are essentially the dead rising to life, right? The dead coming back and then just, you know, kind of, you know, not really resuming their lives the way they did, but like kind of maintaining their personalities, different things along those lines. But this is really one of those instances where it really does look like the apocalypse. And so with Spawn arriving on the scene, we pick up with this guy named Hiroshi Kitamura. And this guy's not really giving us, we're not really giving a lot of story here. All we know is that somewhere along the line that this guy basically died. In addition to him, there's also a young woman that's brought along, uh, brought along as well by the name of of Kumiko. Now, for the most part, all they've known is darkness for a pretty lengthy amount of 
time. And for the most part, they were seemingly yanked out of the body of Spawn by Christopher himself. And so the result is that he basically he basically tells these two guys, you all are going to be endowed with some measure of power. You guys are here to help me, you know, essentially quell this threat, right? These undead zombies that are running around this city. And so it's kind of interesting because Kumiko is more or less obsessed with video games. And her grandfather is a lot more traditional insofar as he's kind of like the slow moving guy, right? Like analyze the situation, figure out what's going on. Don't just rush in head on. Whereas Kumiko just grabs some guns and just starts shooting the place up. And the reason why is because for her, she used to play this game that, that really had her just like wiping out zombies in a game called Zombie Wipeout. And so she got really good at killing zombies. And so it's kind of like her thing, right? It's her repertoire. Now there's a reason for why it was that she was chosen here along with her grandfather. But once they get in here, they immediately just start kind of unloading, right? You know, you have her grandfather who's just tearing everything up, at least slicing heads off and so on. And you've got Kumiko, you know, shooting everything up that she possibly can. And things are kind of popping off pretty quickly. The issue with this is that as the situation begins to unfold and as they begin to really take on their true forms, because this has all happened within the span of minutes, right? So their bodies are, are still transforming from how they look when they first pop up to when they really start to gain these powers and more or less become their spawn selves, more or less, or spawn versions for lack of a better word. But Kumiko is, of course, surrounded by zombies and then she's ultimately saved by her grandfather. And then once they get inside this place, this preacher who had essentially called all these people together and who was saying, hey guys, like, you know, all we have to do is pray, everything will be fine. Then ultimately they're, of course, being consumed by zombies. Now for the Spawn series being as religious as it is, the fact that like God's not answering their prayers is a big hint to what's going on. But we'll find out what it is that's taking place here in a second. But it's one of these things where like with these characters being essentially brand new and us not really getting a lot of them aside from the fact that like they're killing zombies and kind of going on a war path, that they, that's when she begins to realize the reason why they're beginning to look the way they do, kind of decayed, breaking down, things like that, is because they are in fact dead. And that's when the grandfather realizes I'm the one who killed her, right? Like he killed his own granddaughter. That kind of seems to have been the case. That's where things are sort of popping off here. We end up learning there's a handful of things that are going on. The first is that humanity is crying out for God to save them, right? This place, Joshua, Tennessee, Joshua Creek, is not the only place where things are going wild. It seems to be the only place where the dead are rising, but it's not the only place where people are sort of panicking and looking to God to save them from whatever it is that's taking place. That nobody, that, that essentially God is not answering anybody's prayers. That heaven itself is under siege. But the reason why God's not answering anybody's prayers is because God is not there. The throne of heaven is empty. No one knows where God is. And so what we do here is we pick up with essentially the angels of heaven, right? These warrior angels. Now, you guys will probably remember them from our origin on Angela. We didn't really touch too much on them after that. And in reality, what you learned in that video is really all you need insofar as they are the individuals who are charged with protecting heaven against whatever invaders would, would come to its doorstep, namely the forces of hell. But the fact that the forces of hell are so huge in number and the forces of heaven are dwindling so fast really all points to the idea that the forces of hell are going to win out, right? Everybody in, in heaven is essentially going to die at some point. Hence the reason why the character of Zera has basically been resurrected. Now, the way in which her character plays out is really cool, right? What we end up learning here is that somewhere along the line, Zera was an agent of heaven uh, and was really considered to be God's most loyal servant. She had a bloodlust that was really un unchallenged. Nobody was on the same level as she was when it came to like destroying enemies, right? She's an exceedingly powerful member of the heavenly pantheon. The issue with this is that once her bloodlust takes over, it's like Thor in his warrior's madness. All reason and logic go out the window. And all she wants to do is just destroy everything. And so because of the fact that she was kind of considered to be this sort of chaotic concept insofar as her going, being sent out into the field and then killing these various forces would require God to monitor her all the time and then eventually reel her back because she wasn't really in control of herself. Ultimately, this basically led to God imprisoning her from the time that he sort of began to realize that she was uncontrollable, essentially up until now when she's been free. Now this kind of begs the question, why didn't God just fix her so she should, uh, she could be controlled? I don't know, probably for the sake of the story. But regardless, her her rage manifests in the form of like this giant beast of war. But it's this idea that the angels of heaven really look at her and say, with her being on the battlefield now, the tide has turned because she's more than enough to take out all these forces, these 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 members of the forgotten of Lord uh, Mammon, who are all basically trying to lay siege to the gates of heaven. And so following that, what we end up doing is basically picking up to, you know, all these individuals who have been more or less massacred by the Hindu goddess Kali. At least I believe it's Hindu. The way it's kind of depicted here, that sort of seems to be the case. But before we jump into that, what we end up doing is picking up with the Man of Miracles. And 
the Man of Miracles essentially visits Spawn. And it's kind of interesting because a Man of Miracles will sort of make these appearances here and there. And now again, if you know who, who the Man of Miracles is, please do not spoil anything. We will find out in the next video. But the Man of Miracles basically says that like there really isn't going to be a way for you to, to stop this. You can if you want to, but at the end of the day, you're going to need Christopher to make this happen, right? Like talk to Chris, he will know what to do. And so again, things are kind of ambiguous here. There's a lot of questions popping up that we don't really get definitive answers to, but we will, so do not worry, right? So the next thing that we end up doing is basically, you know, having Christopher travel back into spawn and then sort of end up in this giant desert plain uh, with these two individuals. And, and what we end up finding out here is that the man's name is Amal and the woman's name is Shanti. And they've basically kind of existed here and they sort of recognize where they are to a degree insofar as they seem to basically be part of spawn. But it's also this idea that their karma is more or less tainted, right? And I don't know if it's really tainted in the traditional sense insofar as like they did bad things to people, but it's, it's this idea that they cannot truly cross over. And the reason why is that for them, they're still holding on to this kind of earthly presence, right? This, this thing that still binds them to the earth as it exists now. And the reason why is because once they're yanked out and they start having this conversation with Spawn, what they say is according to their belief system, they follow something called the Book of Vetus, right? These, this book that really gives people a, a kind of direction, a sort of compass when it comes to wisdom and, and the things that they can uh, that they can read that essentially contains the legends of the gods. That in the religion itself, that it follows a process whereby they, they die and they're reborn multiple times in an effort to basically achieve nirvana to essentially achieve spiritual perfection. And that according to these legends, that Kali was created out of pure light to battle the forces of Mahishasura, I think it is. I apologize if I've mispronounced that, uh, but basically to, to, to battle his forces of darkness. The issue with this is that as Kali began to battle these forces, she began to become corrupted by her bloodlust, right? This idea of just eventually destroying and killing everything. And so in response to that, her husband Shiva essentially laid himself down among the dead. And then she came to believe that she had essentially killed him. And so in that moment, uh, she had basically sort of experienced a kind of, uh, of, of sympathy, right? A kind of pain for what it was that she had done. But ultimately, this whole thing is just a more or less a myth, is how they refer to it, that it's really an allegory. It's not designed to be taken literally. It's just designed to show how easy it is, one, when it comes to the forces of good and evil, to how easy it is to fall to the evil side, right? How easy it is to stray from the path of righteousness, more or less, and become the worst version of themselves. Now, this is where things sort of shift, because what Todd, or I guess not really Todd McFarlane, it's David Hine who writes this, but what he ends up doing is like shifting the whole thing on his head and saying, no, Kali is very much real. <laughs> the other part of this is that Kali's really depicted as being on a, a pantheon of power while not necessarily tied directly into heaven and hell, into G uh, Judeo Christianity. She appears to be on a level of power that's higher than that of Spawn, right? This is all kind of stated by way of the fact that Spawn doesn't immediately get into a conflict with her and kill her, but also kind of, you know, things like I could destroy you easily if I wanted to, right? I could annihilate you in your entirety if I wanted to, right? So that kind of seems to be the case that in reality, she's just that much more powerful than Spawn himself. And so following this, you end up getting this, this interesting sort of situation, right? Where Spawn kind of rehashes what is it he's doing when he basically says I'm here to prevent the apocalypse and she's like well you can't you can't prevent that why would you try you're a hell spawn you're supposed to fight on the on the sides of good or evil really on the side of evil that's your purpose and his response is well I, I choose who I fight for and this is kind of cool because what it shows is that even though Kali's not really part of Judeo Christianity it's all something everybody is aware of right so it's very similar to Marvel in that regard right insofar as you have like the 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 sky fathers right you've got Odin you've got Zeus all that kind of stuff they're aware of who they are right so it's just this great big huge sort of shared space and that's kind of a cool thing to see, right? It's, it's it's interesting. It kind of changes the way that you see the story to a degree. But the long and short of it is that essentially you end up having this deal that's kind of being struck. That Shanti and her husband really say like, basically Kali says, I will leave this place and I will spare Spawn if you're willing to give up that which you value most, that which means the most to you. And the result is that we kind of learn their origin story. And what we end up finding out is that somewhere along the line, that Shanti and her husband were basically expecting, right? She was pregnant with a child. And that as they were making their way to their parents' house, they ended up going around this mountainside, this bend, and there was the, the road was too thin really for them to avoid a truck that was coming around. The result was that they were knocked off the side of the mountain and they ended up dying. And so when they present the child to Kali, the response of Kali is, well, this child's neither alive nor dead, right? This child is, is reborn from whatever its life was before. But the fact that it hasn't been born means it, it hasn't left its previous life, but it has not started its new life. It's just kind of stuck there in a state of limbo. And while the parents realize this, at the end of the day, it's their child and they just don't really have the heart to let it go. But because of the fact that there are much bigger things at play here and because achieving their ability to move beyond their, their their current forms and potentially pass on and even reach nirvana, they end up giving up their child. They end up sacrificing their child to Kali, who basically says, I'm giving this child the gift of death, therefore it can be reborn again in whatever form it's going to take. And so satisfying this bargain, Kali basically leaves. Kali walks away and allows Spawn to continue on his journey. Now, this is where things 
really begin to pop off. This is where things really begin to get nuts. And the reason why is because what we do here is we pick up, well, we can kind of cover the origin story of, of, of Kimiko, right? So the, the origin story of her and her grandfather, for those of you guys who were interested, the origin story here is that when they were alive, basically, they were, of course, alive in the modern era. But the grandfather was very much beholden to Japanese tradition, right? Or at least that, that seems to be the case, right? He talked about Bushido cultures, but the tradition of respecting oneself and, and, and the people around them that all went into it. His children were a little more progressive insofar as they considered the beliefs and the teachings of their father to be old hat. And then you had Kumiko, who was even more progressive than that. And as far as she was concerned, she didn't really care about the traditions of her grandfather. And she was at that rebellious age where she was like, I just want to go and do my own thing. My parents just won't understand me, that kind of situation. And so as a result of that, we end up finding out that her grandfather had actually been following her for a few weeks whenever she left the house. And he had considered what she'd done to kind of be disrespectful. But more so than that, he basically wanted to save her. That what he had discovered is that in her private life, that she had basically been going to like nightclubs, bars, different things like that, that she'd been going and engaging in drugs. She'd been prostituting herself to pay for drugs. And so she was living this pretty horrible lifestyle. And so traveling to essentially this drug den in order to save her, what he ends up doing is of course, showing up there with a samurai sword. He in turn, you know, kills the guy who answers the door. And then everybody else starts opening fire, right? And so ultimately Kumiko jumps in the way to save the life of her grandfather and then her grandfather perishes as well. But that's how all this went down, right? It's, it's pretty violent and, and pretty extreme, but that's how all of this ended up going down. But the real meat and potatoes of this and, the, and really the most important thing comes with the twins, Jake and Katie, of Terry and Wanda Fitzgerald. Now, for those of you guys who are, are not super familiar with this, and this is why I think covering the origin story was so important, after Al Simmons was killed and then he was basically resurrected as Spawn, during that, what is it, five year or eight year time period uh, before he ended up returning, that Wanda believed he was actually dead. And so believing that he was dead, she married his friend, right? Married his best friend because he was there for her when she needed him, that kind of a thing. And so while Cyan is the daughter of Wanda and Al Simmons, Jake and Katie are the children of uh, Terry and Wanda themselves. The issue with this is that following their birth, they've been displaying these almost kind of psychotic tendencies, right? Like wanting to destroy things, different things like that. They've been putting magnets on the fridge and it said stuff like kill mommy, things along those lines. And so Wanda ends up coming home after the babysitter is keeping an eye on the kids. And then like, essentially you have like Katie who bashed in the head of Jake with a baseball bat, smashed his head in. And Wanda immediately starts to freak out. But the crazy thing is that in the midst of all that, Jake basically gets up, right? And his head starts to heal. Everything starts to go back to normal. And Wanda has no idea what to make of it all. But while that was happening, when Jake was unconscious, she had called the cops and basically said, I think my child is dead and that kind of a thing. And it all just sort of went nuts after that. When, when the cops show up, as far as they're concerned, Jake's got a scratch on his head. And the explanation is, well, Jake seems to have fallen and bumped his head. That's how they that's how they assume things went down. But of course, Wanda tries to explain everything to Terry that something's wrong. Their kids are not their kids. Something's not right, right? Things just aren't making sense. That they've always kind of displayed these crazy tendencies and it's really becoming more than Wanda has been able to handle. And so all this basically comes to a head when you end up having the twins who basically grab a knife and they end up tying up Wanda along with uh, with Cyan and then just kind of like stick them in there, right? I mean, they've got like the dad tied up. So like Terry's tied up. They're all basically tied up. And the twins look like they're, I mean, they got, they have, they have like a gun. Things are about to pop off, right? Like things are about to get kind of nuts. So they've, they seem to have kind of lost their minds. At the very least, Terry's starting to see what it is that Wanda's been talking about, about their kids being crazy this entire time. And so following this, we switch back over to Zara. And Zara did exactly what she was expected to do, which was basically just lay waste to the forces of the of the Forgotten and essentially destroy them all. And so ultimately, because the you know all the Forgotten are believed to have been destroyed, she asks them, how does it feel to be the last one left? Are there any more of you? And before this person gives the name, she snaps the guy's neck. And so as a result of that, you, know, you end up basically having the other angels who were there kind of watching everything unfold. And it's like, okay, this is kind of nuts, but like, what do we sort of do here? <laughs> you know, and, and basically it's this notion of her basically saying like, we're going to initiate the rap. With heaven's forces being depleted, we're going to recall all those from earth who were faithful to God. And when the response is, but only God can initiate the rapture and God's not here, we don't know where he's at. Then Zara's response is, then I'm going to go find him. I'm going to go find God. The next time you see me, God will be at my side. And so what you end up having here is you basically end up having Callie, you know, kind of picking up with, with her character only for Callie to basically transform back into the man of miracles, right? So that kind of seems to have been the case that the man of miracles essentially went to go test spawn or whatever the case is. We don't really know what the reason behind this is, but he's kind of musing to himself about everything that's going on and says there's truth behind all of these charades everything that's going on from the time that al simmons became spawn up until now has all been part of a plan more or less it's all been part of a greater plan that's what he's hinting at and saying there's truth behind all of this but only one can set everyone free a child will save everyone and that's when we're basically given this kind of perception of what what basically ends up looking like cyan and so that's where things sort of go nuts because what we do here is we end up picking up directly with spawn and his guys who are just kind of having this conversation and what we end up getting is this explanation of why Spawn had like people inside of him. You know, when, when you have Spawn and you have Sam and Twitch
Rich and Christopher and like and all these guys all having this conversation, what we end up learning is that when Al Simmons died, that essentially around 6,000 other people all died within the same hour. And for whatever reason, that those 6,000 other people were all bonded to Spawn. But this is the reason why it is that where Spawn didn't know that they were there back in the early days, that Malboja could not control Spawn. He could not make Spawn do whatever it is that he wanted to do. That Malboja was trying to control 6,000 people and not realizing that. And that kind of seems to have been part of the plan that the Man of Miracles was talking about, although we're not entirely sure. Now, as far as Sam and Twitch go with their investigations, only about 2,000 names have been found. But what this means is that Spawn is armed with all these individuals who can essentially help him along this path in his war against heaven and hell. And so that's when things kind of get interesting, because from there, you basically switch back over to uh, to Wanda, and you switch back over to Cyan, and you switch back over to Terry and all these guys. And you have the kids who were just like, okay, so like, let's kill him. Like, let's do our thing. I mean, why not? Just kind of giving in to their darker and, and twisted selves. And so where things start popping off, and it's this idea that they're just going to kill him and they're going to take these guys out, suddenly Spawn pops up. And when he does, it's kind of like, okay, so like essentially saving, you know, Wanda and Terry from Jake and Katie and uh, Cyan, who looks like she's basically on her deathbed, more or less, looks like she's about to die, uh, seeming like he's going to save them. The issue with this is that when he goes to kill Jake and Katie under this idea that what Wanda's telling him is true, that they're not the really their children, they're possessed by something or or something's got them screwed up, you know, possessed by demons, whatever the case is, who knows? Uh, the spawn goes to try to take them out and they cannot die. You know, initially it's believed that they did. The chains pierce them, you know, they come crashing down, Terry starts freaking out, you know, calls them a murderer and believes that they're dead, but ultimately they're not, right? They end up getting back up again. And then suddenly there's this huge kind of rattling sound and literally Zara just comes smashing into the building. And when it's just like, who in the heck are you, right? When Jake responds like, who in the hell are you? Then Zara immediately bends down and says, I am your faithful servant. And it's like, who in the heck is she? And basically Katie says, yes, now I remember who I am, you know? And, and Jake stands up and says, I do too. My name is not Jake. What this all points to is the idea that the son, <laughs> the son of Wanda and Terry is none other than God himself. Okay, so I think it's safe to say that you guys absolutely loved the Spawn Armageddon video that we did. <laughs> Spawn's war against God and Satan begins. A lot of you guys really seemed like, what about that title though, right? But like, it's it's legit, right? Like, like what do you guys think, right? Because you guys really seem to like it. So in this one, we're, this this is actually technically part of the second the, the second part of the story because we're splitting into three sections, maybe three or four sections. But this one I decided to do on its own. And the reason why is because this is the origin of God. God, Satan, and everything how it all came into existence, which is a cool thing, right? Because it kind of expands and builds in the Spawn mythos in a really, really cool way. So in the last video that we did, we basically had this great big, huge revelation that the twin children of Wanda and Terry, uh, basically Jake and Katie, that Jake himself was God, or at least it was revealed that he was God, which begged the question, who was Katie? And I'm sure a lot of you guys have probably figured it out by now, but that's kind of what goes on, right? You know, with this kind of revelation here, you know, Jake almost sort of gets carried away with himself. He's like, all my memories are coming back now. Now I remember who I am. I'm God. And the way that the, the way that God operates here is interesting because you would expect that Jake acting in kind of like this, this really violent manner as a child or something like that is maybe just like him being a crazy kid. But as soon as his memories came back of him being God, he would go to become more enlightened. He'd become more caring. He'd be a very benign person. Like, I'm sorry, my children, for the way I conducted myself, that kind of a thing. No, he's a dick. Like, dude, it's, it's nuts. <laughs> You know, he's like, I am God. I created all of you guys out of mud and you guys all should bow before me, you know, and all. And it's just like extreme arrogance and hubris, right? And so in response to that, Katie's memories all begin flowing back. And then Katie comes to the realization that she's Satan. And it's just kind of like, wow, you know, and then from there, like they both get pissed. They're like, who stuck us in these bodies, right? Like who put us in this place? And so in response to that, God basically tells Zara, kill Spawn, right? Like take him out and then we'll worry about everybody else later. You know, because initially they say like, you have to kneel down, right? Like kneel down to us, bow down to us. And at the end of the day, Spawn's like, no, like I'm not, I'm not going to, you know, like, like give us all the information you have. Like, no, I'm not going to, right? Spawn's like, I'm not doing that. You're crazy if you think I am. And so in response, God's like, make him talk. So Zara goes to get into a conflict with Spawn. And it's kind of interesting, right? Because where the two of them go and they, they clash, you know, as soon as their as soon as their weapons touch, they stop, right? And they're separated. And when that happens, God and Satan begin to get pissed off. And Satan's like, you know, you don't have the right to do any of this. And this this being is like, but I do though, because like I'm your mother. I'm the one who created you. And that's when we start to get this this really cool origin. Because immediately the mouths of Satan and God are sealed shut, right? So whoever this being is is more powerful than they are. Seals their mouth shut. They can't talk. And then says, it's time all of you learned the truth. And 
And so what we end up finding out here is that when Spawn starts talking to this person known as Mother, what she says, or it's, it's not really a she, it kind of transcends genders, but what Mother ends up saying here is there was essentially me, right? Like I created everything. I created all the gods that are in existence. I have a whole bunch of different faces and you've met me countless times before. You met me when I was disguised as Kali, the goddess of destruction. You met me when I was disguised as the man of miracles. I stand beyond all gods that exist inside your universe, right? I am the god of all gods. And it's kind of crazy because what mother ends up saying is like, I'm the creator and destroyer of worlds. I created everything in this universe. And this is not the only planet that houses gods. Every planet around this entire universe has gods. You know, every planet and every single solar system and every galaxy and every universe has its own gods that its people lay worship to. But of all the gods that I've created over the course of my entire existence, Satan and God, as you see him, are the most disappointing, right? And that's what's kind of crazy about it is because it's like initially, you know, like mother basically treats them exactly like children, right? That when they were initially created, that there was kind of like some bickering and some squabbling, but that as time went on, their bickering and squabbling turned into full scale warfare against each other. But something happened that ultimately mother didn't expect that God created mankind. But the funny thing about it is, is that, that Todd McFarlane really grabs this notion of like how humanity exists now and rolls it in in a perfectly genius way, right? Because according to biblical scripture, depending on how you look at it, some take it literally, some don't, but it's kind of an ongoing war between God and, and Satan, right? That God created humanity and God loves humanity and that kind of a thing. And that Satan is always trying to trick humanity and then bring humanity down to its level, right? You know, to kind of bolster his army and God's trying to bolster his army and the two of them are going to have like a final war or something like that. But in, you know, true biblical scripture, at least if you're New Testament, God's not like out to get you. Like I'm just looking for reasons to draw a line through your name instead of under it. That's Old Testament stuff, right? But like New Testament is a, is a wholly different beast. But the way this picture is painted here is that for the most part, like it's kind of an ongoing war between the two, but Satan is always trying to grab humanity, right? Like always trying to trick humanity. At the end of the day, God is doing his thing, but like Satan's always trying to find a way to get humanity to his side. And that's what makes it kind of nuts is because for all their grandeur and, and for all their pomp and circumstance, because of everything that, that's that's gone on here because of this war between the two, which is really kind of depicted as Old Testament, you know, scripture, more or less, that essentially mother came along and said, enough is enough. I've had enough of watching you guys fight each other. I've had enough of you guys go into war between heaven and hell. This is not what I intended when I created you. And so as a result of that, mother basically puts them in a state of suspended animation. And then mother shows up in the form of Jesus Christ. And that's where you get Jesus as kind of like this sort of savior, right? This super benign guy who's like, hey dudes, like, hey peeps, you know, like God's cool, man. Like, you know, it's cool. Cool. Don't be dicks to each other. Don't burn each other at the stake, different things like that. Mother appeared in a way that was designed to basically tell people, here's how you're supposed to function, right? You're supposed to truly care about the other people around you. Think more about them than you do about yourself. And somebody will think more about you than they do about themselves, right? Everybody will care about everybody else. Now, the reality is that if everybody cared about everybody else indiscriminately, the world couldn't function. But the fact remains that despite the efforts of mother to curtail humanity, that in the end, it was too late, right? The nature of humanity was set in stone. That people were continuing to war over which religion was actually right, who was on the right side, essentially. And so that's why Mother basically says, even after appearing in the form of Jesus, people still kept twisting up my viewpoints. They kept twisting up how it was all supposed to be and using religion more or less as a weapon to further their own personal agendas, whether it's entire armies and kingdoms or just some crazy preacher down south somewhere. Regardless of the situation, people kept twisting things out. Well, then the question is, why are God and Satan in the bodies of children? And the response of her is, because I thought that in forcing them to be reborn in the form of humanity, that they would learn to appreciate what it meant to be human. They would learn to appreciate what it meant to be human beings. But the reality is that never changed. That never stopped. You know, even though they didn't know who they were, they still had this extremely and extraordinary amount of power. And the result was that the various battles and, and skirmishes they were getting into were literally causing all kinds of problems around the world. And so then it turns into the idea that eventually Al Simmons died. And that's where mother saw her chance to intervene yet again. When Al Simmons died, there were 6,000 other people that died in the same hour that he did. And so in response to that, realizing that Mal Boja, just one of the many hell lords that exists under Satan, was essentially bolstering his army as a means to take on heaven, that mother saw this as an opportunity to create someone that could essentially be her personal soldier, more or less. She doesn't really say it in so many words, but that's more or less what Spawn is. That Spawn is someone who doesn't really follow the follow the beliefs of God or Satan, that he does his own thing, right? He walks his own path. And that's what makes him so unique, is that mother saw this and said, okay, in that case, Spawn can be used right? And to kind of allow this Armageddon to take place, allow the, the end of all things to take place. Now, this is kind of the difference between Armageddon or like the rapture in the Judeo-Christian sense and like how things are going down here, right? In Judeo-Christianity, the rapture is really nothing more than like the stories of the faith
faithful being taken back to heaven, right? You have the seven bowls of God's wrath, and you got the seven trumpets of the apocalypse, and, and so on and so forth, and the plagues return to earth, and you know, all that kind of crazy stuff. Basically, everything goes belly up, is more or less what it is. But it's this notion of like the taken, those who are faithful being whisked away to heaven before it all begins, and then those who are unfaithful being left behind, and then, then it kind of breaks down based on different stories that you read and so on. But here, the Armageddon is tried and true Armageddon, the destruction of everything, presumably everything except for Mother, and we'll find out how all this, this plays out later on. But it really is the end of everything, presumably the end of God, the end of Satan, the end of humanity, the end of the, of the, end of the whole damn thing, right? Like, that's basically what it is. The whole kit and caboodle all gets the boot. And that's what's kind of nuts here, is because following that, because Armageddon has begun, because the war of God and Satan has to play out in order for Armageddon to take place, the question of Spawn is, well then why don't you just fix everything? If you created God and Satan, then get it together. Fix God, fix Satan, stop making him, like, stop letting him be dicks to each other, get humanity on the right path, then there's no need for me anymore, and I can just live in the afterlife, I can go to heaven and just experience some peace, hell's bells, like, just let me live, man, just let me go! And, and the response of Mother is, I can't. And the reason why is because I, as Mother, am beholden to laws of the universe because I made them. What's the point of having laws if I just break them willy-nilly? I don't break them because they not, they're not meant to be broken. What kind of a role model would I be if I create and break my own rules, but then say nobody else can? At that point, you just, it just comes down to you being a, being a jerk, right? You're just being a dick, you know? And, and so at the end of the day, you know, what you end up having is God and Satan being sent back to their respective places, right? God is sent back to heaven. Satan is sent back to hell. But when God shows up here along with Zara, he basically looks at all the other seraphim, right? All the other angels who have been here and has basically said, you guys have all been slacking off. Apparently, like some folks from hell managed to break in and kill a whole bunch of my army. You know, Satan is, is doing his whole thing. Like, what have you guys been doing all this time, right? Have you guys just been like resting on your laurels, sitting around watching the view? Is that what you guys have been doing? Like, just kind of just, just really, really hard on them, right? And, you know, and, and so in response to that, he's like, you know, with basically almost all of our forces dwindled, the time now comes to take the faithful. Those individuals who worshipped me, but didn't really know what I was about, believed that I was like a kind and caring God, it doesn't matter, bring them, right? So like the rapture begins essentially. And at that moment, that's when we switch back over to Spawn and over to Wanda and Terry and all these guys. Now, Mother's still there and Mother's watching it all unfold. But while you end up having Spawn and Terry, you know, really Terry, who's just like screaming and yelling at Spawn over everything, for Wanda, it's just too much to handle. It's more than she can cope with. And so what Wanda ends up doing is basically taking a pistol out and, and walking all the way up to the master bedroom, nobody realizing she's there, walking all the way up to the master bedroom, taking the, uh, taking the pistol, pointing it to herself, and then pulling the trigger. Uh, FYI, patrons, those of you guys who are patrons, make sure you check out the announcement uh, announcement post that I made on Patreon about the start of our next uncensored uh, uncensored video series. I think you guys are really going to like it. So uh, it's the next uncensored series. It's going to be on Patreon only. Uh, no holds barred. You'll probably hear me cussing. There'll definitely be like swear words and all kinds of stuff in the comic. Uh... Yeah, so like comics explained uncut, basically. <laughs> That's how you guys are gonna see it. But uh, but in any event, we're finally getting back into Spawn Armageddon, right? And, and a lot of you guys really seem to enjoy it, which I'm really happy to see, right? Because I wasn't sure if you guys were really going to enjoy this series or not, but I'm glad you guys are, glad you guys love it, but we're kind of reaching the finality, right? Like we've got this video and I think we've got one more and then we're done with Spawn Armageddon and then we go into the aftermath because I guess we're gonna keep Spawn going. But in any event, if you guys wanna get caught up, I have a playlist for Spawn now, right? It has like the origins video, Video, the origin of his character, the introduction of Angela, and then it goes directly into what we've covered so far. So you can get caught up quick, fast, and in a hurry uh, with regards to the to the mythos. Not a whole lot of videos. I think it's maybe like three or four videos up to this point. But in any event, we're kind of picking up here with with really the aftermath of Wanda had basically you know offed herself because everything she's learned here has really just been too much to process. Right, this idea that her twin children aren't really her twin children. Instead, they're basically God and Satan reborn in human form. Now again, this really ties into the mother of all creation, which is to say the creator of the universe, this being that created all these various gods across the entirety of the universe uh, for every civilization that exists out there. And of all the gods who were created, God and Satan are deemed to be failures because instead of serving the role which was assigned to them, which is to say the traditional Judeo-Christian role, instead they basically just bicker amongst each other. And so in order to teach them what it meant to be human, the mother of all creation essentially sealed them away and then recreated their essences in human form, right? And that's where we kind of are right now. But the toll of Wanda learned 
learning that basically her children, her twin children are God and Satan, is far more than she can grasp. And so because of all that, with it being too much to handle and, and all this kind of really, you know, coming coming to a head, Wanda ends up going into the bedroom, you know, as we saw, and then grabbing the gun and turning it on herself. Now, where we ended the last video with pre the presumption that Wanda had died, instead, the mother of all creation froze time. And the reason why is because what this meant is it basically allowed uh, the mother of all creation to address Spawn and to simply say, I understand how important she is to you, right? Because without her, you would lose your will to fight. And it's important that you fight. And so what this does is it allows Spawn to basically pull the bullet away and then to keep Wanda alive. And so again, this is kind of yet another instance on the stack of all these things that have made life ridiculously difficult for her. And so in response to that, of course, you have Terry who's basically freaking out. The response to Spawn is do something, right? Do something to fix this and to make it right. And so as a result of that, what the mother of creation does is she basically wipes Wanda's mind of everything. Now, it's also told that she wipes the mind of Terry and Cyan. But what we're going to learn about Cyan is that that's not necessarily the case, right? Terry's kind of been made to forget about the twins, the fact that they were God and Satan and all that kind of stuff. And uh, and Wanda was as well. Presumably so is Cyan. But at, at this moment, it's really more of, of the role that Cyan is going to play. And the reason why is because what the mother of creation does is she basically leaves with Spawn. And what she tells him is that this role you're going to play in Armageddon, this final battle between God and Satan, is a war that you need to be prepared for. And at the moment, you are not. Cyan is going to be the person that's going to save you, right? She's going to be the one that's basically going to put you in a position to where you can win this war. And that's why we saw in the previous video, when the mother of all creation was more or less musing, you know, as the man of miracles, the mother of all creation was saying, a child will save everyone. And that's exactly Exactly what this is. It's Cyan basically being the person who's going to guide Spawn to success. And the reason why this matters is because Spawn has to face off against the Disciple. But in order to kind of create this bridge with Cyan, what he has to do is show her his true face, to show her what Spawn really is. And so ultimately, he ends up visiting her and then basically kind of opens himself up and pours out this massive collection of insects, essentially saying like, I am a monster, right? I'm a monster of the worst kind. How you've seen me is not how I truly am. You have to see me at my absolute worse. And that's when, you know, he's, he's kind of, you know, it's, it's kind of like, it's only bugs, it's only bugs, it's only bugs. And the result is that she basically screams out, you're not a monster. And what this does is it solidifies the bond between Cyan and Al Simmons, that she genuinely and truly accepts him as he is. And that's what was needed. It's game theory. His success depends on the success of Cyan and truly accepting him for who he is. And so because of that, it's one of these things where essentially the enrapture has begun to start, right? Which is to say people being brought up to heaven and to serve God more or less. And it's kind of a funny thing because what we get is this this kind of monologue of sorts, you know, where where Cyan talks about what the rapture is, right? At least in terms of what her grandma had told her the rapture was a, was about. Now, what I want to do here is I want to sidetrack for a second, and I want to have this conversation about Granny Blake, right? Because this is one of those themes that was kind of covered over the course of a lot of the Spawn comics leading up to this point. Now, Granny Blake is not the most significant character in the entire Spawn mythos, but she also kind of is. And the reason why is because she really served in a lot of ways as a kind of religious advisor for Spawn. Not in so far as saying like, here's what you need to do in order to win the favor of God and Satan. But whenever Spawn felt like he was kind of drifting off the path or he was trying to reconcile his existence with the existence of like God and Satan and that kind of a thing, trying to figure out his place in all of this, Granny was the one that kind of guided him back. They basically said God and Satan are beings and, and really kind of espoused the Judeo-Christian belief system of God and Satan, so on and so forth. Because of that, she was a character that like a lot of fans got attached to because of kind of like the emotional support that, that she offered. Now, eventually they kind of went their own way but it was one of these things where Granny Blake was blind, right? So there was this kind of sort of supernatural essence about her in the, in the sense that she could see things that other people couldn't normally see. And that's what created the sort of rapport between herself and Spawn. Now, eventually they kind of had a falling out. They really stopped communicating different things like that. But this is why Granny is really kind of receiving a lot of emphasis here, right? Because in the eyes of Granny, she looked at the idea of heaven and, and hell and looked at it in the traditional Judeo-Christian place. She's going to a place where God truly loves her and, and different things along those lines. She'll be reunited with her husband. And that's how she sees it here, right? You know, as she's making her way from earth, her spiritual essence, or I guess her physical form is leaving earth, you know, as part of the rapture and then entering into heaven. She's reunited with Jack, her former husband who died. She basically kind of takes on this appearance of her being her younger, beautiful self. And of course, she's she's kind of there looking at like God and, and so on and so forth. Now, this is all really given to us as kind of like the, the monologue of Cyan, right? In terms of this is what Granny always told me, God, you know, heaven was going to be like, right? And so it's kind of like, you know, Granny's perception of what heaven should be. The 
reality is anything but, right? As soon as she gets there and she passes through the pearly gates, there's no Jack there, right? There's no, you know, heavenly choir of angels singing, you know, and welcome to heaven, you know, and all that kind of stuff. There's none of that stuff, right? Nobody from her past life that she knew who's there waiting on her or anything like that. There's simply just God as the child. And with Granny being unable to see what's really going on, God basically says, then let me return your sight to you. He gives her her eyesight back. And when she sees what's up, what she sees is this enormous army that's being formed, right? The seraphim of God, Zara basically leading them, all these various soldiers who are there and all these humans who are there who have no clue what's going on, right? Because heaven as it exists, is not what they've been led to believe. And that's kind of the, the crushing sensation of it all is nothing is what they thought it would be. And that's what, that's really what Granny says. You know, this is not what heaven is supposed to be. Heaven is supposed to be like, God loves us. And it's supposed to be the pearly gates. And it's supposed to be happiness everlasting. And, and what, what is this twisted and screwed up place? And that's when God kind of chimes in of like, okay, so like there's what you've been told. And then there's what it really is, right? Like I'm the, I'm like the, the, like the vengeful guy, right? Like I'm the guy, you know, great vengeance and like tearing things up and punishing the wicked. You know, that's my kind of thing, right? And so as a result of this, God's like, you all have been brought here because I need an army. Cause like, we're going to go to war with hell and I kind of need an army. So like you've been conscripted and basically rematerializes all these humans here into his heavenly soldiers. And so following that, what you end up doing is you end up jumping to spawn, picking up with, uh, with uh, the mother of creation and essentially going to face off against the disciple. Now, one thing to understand, this is not the first time that spawn and the disciple have met each other. And in fact, they met each other during spawn issue number 50, where the disciple took out spawn quick, fast, and in a hurry. The big indication there is that the reason why spawn lost is because one, he didn't really have the ability to tap into the 6,000 souls who were part of his body, but also because it was him just fighting on his own. Whereas here, he also has the belief of Cyan kind of backing him, right? Somebody who has faith in him. Now, the reason why this is taking place is because when this battle concludes, if Spawn passes this test, then Spawn will prove himself worthy of the power of the mother of creation, right? Not in so far as he will become the mother of creation, but in so far as Spawn will become a god, which is to say divine Spawn, as a lot of you guys probably know him, right? Spawn with the angel or with the wings and all that kind of stuff. So with that being the case and Cyan kind of backing him, when he goes to face off against the against the disciple, it's, it's kind of a tough battle at first, but after that, you know, after a while, Spawn starts to get the upper hand on the disciple. Now, one thing I want you to notice here is that on this guy's head, he basically has the Roman numeral 412. And there's a reason for that, right? Spawn gets the upper hand on this guy, takes him out pretty, you know, pretty quickly, and then kind of comments, it should not be this easy, right? And that's what he was warned about. The mother, the mother of creation said, much like you, the disciple is more than what he seems. So be aware of that. When this version of disciple is, is defeated, then suddenly uh, disciple 11 pops up. And what disciple 11 says is the person you fought before was James the less right? He was the weakest of all of us. Now you're fighting me. I'm Simon Peter, the rock. And so what this does is it allows, you know, with the help of, uh, of, of Cyan, you know, who's really kind of engaging in this battle, almost in kind of like a video game situation. It allows some of the, the souls of spawn to emerge and basically face off against these other, other disciples while spawn really seems to kind of go for the main prize. Now, the other part of this is that what you have is the return of the timer, the countdown timer. Now this is old hat in a lot of ways. The timer was originally part of the spawn mythos when it first came up, right? And the idea that spawn only had a finite amount of energy. And when that energy ran down to zero, that basically spawn would more or less die. Now, in, in this instance, the timer is much lower than it was before. And so if you guys are familiar with video games, this is in effect a boss battle is basically what this is, right? And it's cool. It's, it's a really, really cool depiction of this whole thing. But spawn facing off against these various disciples and ultimately overcoming them all in almost kind of like a montage fashion, right? Like overcoming each one of these guys basically leads him to facing off against the final disciple. This is Judas Iscariot. Now, Judas Iscariot in Judeo-Christianity was the guy who sold out Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. What we're going to find out here is that in terms of the Spawn mythos, there was a lot more to it than that. But Spawn fighting against Judas Iscariot proves to be exceedingly difficult, right? He is wildly powerful. And so it's interesting because what Spawn was told is that in the beginning, you have to put your trust in Cyan. Cyan knows what she's doing. Trust her her. No matter what she tells you, believe in what she tells you. And so as his power begins to sort of dwindle down, as his power begins to die off, that eventually Cyan comes to the realization that he has to sacrifice himself. Where Spawn goes in for the kill, the response of Cyan is, no, you have to stop. Do not kill him. Let him kill you instead. Let him destroy you. And initially Spawn's reaction is, no, that's kind of ridiculous. That doesn't make any sense, right? Like I have to pass the test. I have to prove how powerful I am by taking out these various disciples. And the response of, of Cyan is, no, 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 don't do 
do that, basically let this guy win. At the same time that all that's happening, the Armageddon is officially beginning, right? You know, the, the, the whole end of times is officially starting as it does, at least according to the book of uh, the book of Rapture, which is with the massive earthquake that basically shakes the world, right? And begins the process of like the coming of the four horsemen and the bowls of God's wrath and the sounding of the trumpets and all that kind of stuff. It begins here. And so the result is that taking this moment, doing exactly what it is it is supposed to do, the disciple essentially impales spawn and kills spawn. If that's correct, which it is, what this means is that spawn has officially passed the test. And what this means is that going forward, spawn will achieve the power of all creation, right? Spawn is now elevated to the power of a god. Okay, so picking up with the next part, did you guys really think I was going to leave you on a cliffhanger? <laughs> did you really think I was going to leave you hanging today? Not at all, right? We got to keep, we got to keep this going, man. We got to keep this going. The power of divine spawn and holy cow. <laughs> It is amazing, right? So what this does is this picks up really with kind of like the beginning of the end of things, essentially like Armageddon in full swing. And now initially there are some strange things going on here that will be explained later on as we as we kind of go through. But with Cyan essentially having helped spawn, you know, and, and during the time when she was helping him face off against the disciple, there was this kind of protective sphere that was created around Cyan to make sure that nothing could harm her, right? That she'd be able to focus explicitly on what it was that she was doing and not have to worry about anything else. Now, outside of the sphere is Wanda and Terry. But as we end up seeing here, there's basically this kind of, you know, monster looking thing that basically starts trying to hammer against this sphere and destroy it uh, with, with Wanda and Terry and, and Cyan inside. Now, of course, it is holding and it is keeping them protected, but this monster being there is really kind of the indication of, okay, this is where everything is really sort of, of coming to an end, right? The rise of the four horsemen and all that kind of stuff. And so picking up with the aftermath of the disciple having killed Spawn, we get the reason why this took place. And the reason for that is because with, with regards to how this function Functions. The disciple, you know, the, the the I guess the element, the personality of Judas Iscariot, as we know from Judeo-Christianity, basically ratted on Jesus, right? Turned Jesus in. In the spawn mythos, it was done because the only way for Jesus's life to have any meaning was if he was crucified. And the only way for him to be crucified was for Judas Iscariot to basically turn him in. So it was the role that Judas played. Spawn is much the same way. Spawn has to die and then be reborn again in order to basically experience all this power, right? To, to kind of be reborn as this new version of himself. And that was kind of the on-running theme, right? Technically, the mother of creation killed God and Satan, and then they were reborn in human form, right? So it's more or less the same process when it comes to Spawn. The issue with this is, is what the mother of creation does is she basically says that in the, in the beginning of humanity, when Adam and Eve were created and they ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, it scared God, right? Because God was now scared of the fact of what they could achieve, that they could in turn, by having knowledge of good and evil, also know of the tree of life. And in consuming or eating from the tree of life, they would become immortal and then become gods much like God and Satan had. That was the fear. That's why they were cast out of, of the Garden of Eden and that's why they were sent out into the world and then things just kind of progressed from there. And so what the mother of creation does is basically take fruit from the, the tree of life and then feed it to Al Simmons. And when that happens, Al Simmons is completely resurrected. Now, with that being the case, he's now divine Spawn or at least he has all this like an insane amount of power to him. Now, it's kind of interesting because Spawn doesn't really know all the power that he has, but he will figure it out and we will see what it is that he can can do with all this power that he's been granted. But one of the ways in which you differentiate between divine spawn and regular spawn are the angel wings. That's usually like, if you ever do a Google search for divine spawn, that's what you will see, spawn with angels wings. That's, that's really kind of the, the, the big differentiation here. Now, the other part of this is the 6,000 souls that were bonded to spawn have now basically been allowed to leave his body. The knowledge and experience that he gained from those souls are still part of spawn himself, but the souls themselves are now out leaving and doing their own thing, including Christopher. But the idea here is that now it's, it's Spawn's job to go out into the world and essentially save it, right? That's the entire purpose of Spawn at this moment. And so one of the first things he does is he stumbles across this old man and we get this first little indication of Spawn's power, right? Insofar as this man comes running at him with a stick and Spawn basically makes the stick disappear and then says, tell me what's going on here. And this is when we get an indication of what had, what had happened, right? For the world out there, they didn't really know what was going on, right? I mean, aside from what was going on inside of the house of Wanda and Terry, nobody knew what was taking place. For them, it was business as usual. People were going to work. People were, were getting, you know, doing their thing. The news was re being reported, all that kind of stuff. And then 
out of nowhere, the four horsemen start to rise. The first one comes pestilence, right? And all those who were in his shadow basically start experiencing all these forms of plagues, right? This idea that like their, their skin starts melting off and different things along those lines. These swarm of insects just come flying out of nowhere with the, with the horsemen of death, right? That basically death starts bringing death to all these various humans around it. Around the same time that happens, famine rises and famine basically drives people to this point of extreme hunger, but never being able to be satiated, right? It's kind of a hunger in their soul that they can never fully satisfy. And then the final horseman to show up is the horseman of war. And this, this kind of scream or this kind of shout that it makes drives people back down into their most primal base forms, twists and screws them up. And that's the kind of being that we saw trying to tear up and trying to destroy the force field that was basically protecting Cyan, Wanda, and Terry. And so following that, the four horsemen across the apocalypse or the four horsemen of the apocalypse start wreaking havoc everywhere, right? The, the forces of hell are more or less kind of solidified in these, these sort of, you know, twisted, screwed up versions of humanity. Humanity. But at this point, what you end up getting is kind of like these armies of heaven and hell who are basically marching to this one particular island. And the reason why is because this is where the final battle is going to take place. And it's kind of interesting because the way it's depicted here is they're within eyesight of each other. All the forces of heaven have to do is look to the right. And like all the forces of hell are right over there. All the forces of hell have to do is look to the left and all the forces of heaven are right there. But they're, they're, they're basically being drawn to this one island, to this one location to basically fight against each other. Now, once they get there, that's when the battle begins to take place and spawn basically travels to that that direct location and comes into contact with zara now remember zara is kind of like this this super powerful agent of heaven right so she's like the 007 of, of heaven more or less i guess i don't really know how to quantify that but she's super powerful right i mean remember she was the one who was able to like decimate the forces of hell when they had entered heaven right the forgotten more or less she decimated all of them single-handedly and so with spawn approaching her you know it's one of these things where it's kind of a vendetta against the two she initially looks at him and says like, you're a hell spawn. My job is to destroy you because you threaten the rule of God. And it's kind of crazy because initially her, her rage, if you guys recall, manifests in the form of a giant beast. Spawn takes this beast out like that. It happens in seconds, right? It's it's ridiculous how fast it gets destroyed. It's kind of nuts here. You know, with that happening, he in turn starts to go after Zara and Zara puts up a good fight, but it's like, nope. Like she gets, she gets taken out quick, fast and in a hurry. For those of you guys who are looking to quantify this, imagine a singular being powerful enough to take out the living tribunal in Marvel Comics in the blink of an eye. Imagine that. That's basically what this is, right? Like the Beyonders, more or less. God out there created Zara as like his number one person, right? The number, like the top person in his arsenal, the one he sends forward to take everything out, the living tribunal-esque kind of a character. Spawn comes along, done so. That's it, right? Like she goes to cut Spawn in half and then Spawn just basically heals himself and then just starts smashing Zara, right? Just absolutely just like crushing this girl and then just sort of just leaves her there, right? And then following that, punches a hole in her and then decapitates her, right? Basically just like rips her head off and that's the end of her. Following that, he starts going forward as he's making his way to where God and Satan are at. You have basically the last two of these massive demon monsters fighting each other. And and one of them is essentially taken out and then starts, you know, kind of lets out this scream of pain. Spawn follows the follows the, the shout only to realize that it's basically Granny Blake, right? Granny Blake was the last soldier fighting. And when, when the armor begins to kind of go away, right? Like Spawn destroys this demon pretty fast. But when the armor starts to kind of melt away and it reveals Granny Granny, uh, Granny Blake, that she basically says nothing was what we thought it was. You were right. God and Satan are, are are dicks, right? Like they're they're like really crappy people. They're not what we thought they were. We thought like God was caring and loving and and, lo and loved us like a father and that kind of a thing. No, like we're pawns in this great big huge game. And you tried to tell me that was true and I didn't believe. But the response of, of Spawn, and this is really kind of cool here, the response of Spawn is, I understand that, but the heaven that you've been shown by this God is not the true heaven. There's got to be a real heaven out there, a real after afterlife for all these people out there, right? This cannot simply be it. If there are other gods on other planets all across the universe, then they're then, then like, where do the gods go when they die, right? Like what, what happens when all this takes place? There has to be some definitive afterlife out there. And that's where you're going. You're going to go to that place and you're going to experience everlasting peace. It's comforting, right? It's comforting for Granny Blake to know that this isn't all there is, right? That like this, this was not it, that, that she was just a pawn in the, the game of God and Satan. And that was it. It's an honorable thing that Spawn does. It's an incredible thing that Spawn does. And so following this, the, the power of Divine Spawn really comes into fruition yet again when he shows up to this location where all these forces of hell are fighting and basically says, this is my world. You have no place here. If your loyalty is to Satan, then go back to hell. And almost like somebody who can warp reality on a planetary and 
even a cosmic scale, the ground literally opens and all these forces are banished back to hell. All these hell spawn are banished back there, right? It's not a wish that like the mother of creation granted. Spawn did that himself. Spawn said, all of you go back to hell and then sent them there, right? And that's where they are now, right? I mean, follow like with that being said, like the forces of Satan are basically gone now, right? Like they're, they're totally obliterated. From there, you end up picking up with Satan himself and Satan begins to kind of ask the question, like, where are all my hell spawn? Like something's missing here. Where are all my hell spawn at? And that's when one of his demons approaches him and says, well, like spawn basically like, like some hell spawn out there with wings sent them all back to hell. I saw it with my own eyes. Satan gets pissed, right? Rips this guy's eyes out. And then from there you end up jumping to God. And basically like spawn shows up on the doorstep of God. And you know, when he says, where is Zara? Spawn says, she's right here. I've got her head. Get out of here, right? Like leave this world. This world belongs to me now, right? Like leave all of this. And so initially God and Satan, you know, kind of team up for a second and then go directly after spawn. And when that happens, spawn unleashes the full totality of his power. And probably one of the most insane displays of the spawn comic that I've ever seen. Spawn unleashes the full totality of his powers and says, let this all be done. And using his abilities cleanses the entirety of the earth. He literally wipes everything out. It's nuts. It says like when he looked about him and saw what he had done, spawn wept for all the world was desolation and mankind was no more. Okay. What's up, members of the Rob Corps? You know, I thought about making you guys wait like weeks for the conclusion of Spawn Armageddon. <laughs> for no other reason than the fact that I could. I even did a poll on Twitter. I was like, should I should I make you guys wait or should I cover it now? And it was kind of crazy. Like half of almost half of you guys were like, just make us wait. And I was like, what? <laughs> I was like, well, that, that's that's not how this was supposed to go. You were supposed to like be like, no, we need it now. And then, you know, like post gifts. But you guys didn't. So that was a little bit disappointing. But we are here <laughs> covering the conclusion of Spawn Armageddon. And as we know, Spawn up to this issue has basically destroyed all life on Earth with the exception of God and Satan, right? They're the only two individuals left. Everything else is essentially dead. And that's kind of the crazy thing about this because when all this goes down, you've got God and Satan who are all almost kind of like taken by surprise. Like Spawn, the protector of humanity, has basically eradicated all beings in existence from the plate, from the face of the earth. It really is just a dead, desolate world, right? All life, all gone. There's, there's just nothing here. Initially, the thought is that like Spawn was crying over what is it he'd done, only for us to find out that Spawn's actually laughing. And the reason why is because he's actually mocking God and Satan. He's like, well, you guys had this plan going on for thousands of years, right? You created people. And then people started going, divvying up into different groups, good guys and bad guys. Some of them went to Satan, someone went to God, and this was all supposed to go into some great big huge grand battle, you know, some grand conflict that the two of you guys are going to fight for however long it was going to be to determine which of you is truly the strongest. And I brought the whole thing to an end like that, you know? So like, what does this say about like, you guys, <laughs> this is all just one big joke. It's literally giving God and Satan a hard time. And so in response to that, they kind of ask the question, like you're just a hell spawn, right? Like you're essentially just kind of like a soldier of hell. How did you manage to pull all this off? You know, and, and basically like, the mother of creation pops up and says like, he's what I made him to be. Following that, God gets pissed. God's like, you B word, <laughs> basically. You know, this, this, is the, this is the friendly stuff. If you wanna see the uncensored videos, go to patreon.com slash comics explain. That's where you get all the uncensored stuff like Punisher Max that we're covering, which is gonna be, which is fun and awesome and totally needs to be uncensored. <laughs> But nonetheless, you know, from there, when the mother of creation is sort of chast uh, chastised by God and Satan, right? Like, you can't do this. Of course, the mother of creation freaks out, says, you know, I, I do what I will. And then Spawn says, there's actually something that you can do for me. And when the mother of creation asks what it is, Spawn says, these two kids look too much like Wanda. Change them into their true forms. I want to see what they truly look like. And that's when we see what God and Satan actually really look like in the Spawn universe. They're naked, but they don't have any junk. So that's, I guess that's okay. Would God and Satan have genitalia? That really is, you know, we ask the serious questions here at Comics Explained. <laughs> We ask the hard hitting questions here, but nonetheless, <laughs> you know, from there, it, it's, it's almost kind of like their desire to, 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 to really kind of instigate a conflict with Spawn, right? And Spawn was warned by the mother of creation, understand by having them in these childlike forms, it curbs their desire for like death and destruction and all those different things. By turning them back into their regular forms, they will have a level of death and destruction that you're not quite ready for. They will have a level of power that you could challenge, but that you're not really capable of going toe to toe with at the moment 
it would simply just take time. And Spawn's response is, whatever, man. Like, if these guys really believe that they have what it takes to take me out, then let them do their worst. And so following that, they basically blast Spawn, and Spawn gets taken out, right? You know, he says, it is finished. Spawn is essentially destroyed, right? So this great big huge climactic battle that's been building up between Spawn and, like, God and Satan happens with a quickness. And that's basically it. And that's when the Mother of Creation asks, are you content now? Are you happy now? That was the last of the human race. These beings that you had the power to create, you destroyed, right? That's all you guys are good for, is just destroying things. And that therein is the, the very nature of the Mother of Creation's disappointment with her creation of God and Satan. All they do is destroy. And it's why she considered them to be failures. And so for a moment, there's almost kind of like this sort of reprieve, where Satan, of all people, is kind of like, man, like, you know, where God's like, is this what we've come to? And Satan's kind of like, yeah, man, maybe we should kind of rethink things. And then immediately, God turns on Satan and says, this is your fault. And that's when, when everything kind of devolves right back down to where it was before. God created humanity, and humanity were basically oblivious to everything around them, right? They just kind of existed. They had no knowledge of good and evil. And then Satan pre you know, presented Eve with the, uh, with the apple of the knowledge of good and evil. She consumed it, and then gave it to Adam, and then Adam consumed it, and then they had knowledge of good and evil. And free will is what came from that. And so following that, they basically bent to their base desires. And that's where the, the argument gets intriguing, right? Because if all Satan did was basically say, here's knowledge of good and evil, then did Satan really do anything to make humanity evil? Or did he give humanity the ability to choose which side it wanted? And, the, and humanity chose to become evil. Like humanity chose that role. They bent to their inherent desires. It's kind of intriguing there because when it comes to good and evil, I remember learning this lesson in Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic of all games, that the path to goodness is usually much, much harder than the path to evil. Now, the path to evil is more fun. During Knights of the Old Republic, I was a dick. Like I was, I was using my force powers on everyone. I was just like, like I remember there was this one chick on Tatooine. She's like, we really need this raid plate. And like, can you please? And I was like, give me that. And I was like, thank you. I was like, what is it? I said, my need is greater than yours and just took it. I was like, <laughs> I was a terrible person. <laughs> Everybody played the dark side first. And don't even give me any of that nonsense about how you play the light side first. You didn't. You played the dark side first. Nobody chose them. Nobody chooses the light side. Jedi suck. But nonetheless, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of fun here. <laughs> it's kind of crazy because following this, God and Satan basically just kind of devolve down into this full on battle with each other. And while that's happening, Spawn had essentially been saved by the mother of creation. And what she basically tells him here is this is the nature of God and Satan. They will fight for all eternity, right? They're evenly matched and they are immortal, they're never going to be able to overcome the other. And that's kind of the nature of good and evil. And that's one of the cool things about this, right? Because you cannot have one without the other. You cannot have goodness without the antithesis in the form of evil, because it's only with evil that understanding the value of goodness comes into play. And so because of that, you know, Spawn is, is really kind of like, what do we do here at this point, right? I mean, the earth is all devoid of life. There's nothing here anymore. Like, what do we do? And the mother of creation says, you can recreate everything, right? This earth is basically gone. This earth is, is gone and done now. It's the, the territory of God and Satan. They're going to fight on it forever, right? As long as they believe humanity has been destroyed, they're just going to fight against each other forever and ever and ever and never really overcome the other, right? It's just what's going to happen until the end of time or until they destroy their world or whatever the case is. But you, Al Simmons, have the ability to recreate. You have the ability to give birth to everything. And so this is really, and, and kind of a misnomer from the last video, this is really the full totality of Divine Spawn's power. Because using the help of the mother of creation, Spawn essentially recreates all existence. Spawn literally recreates the earth and all humanity in it. But the funny thing about this is that instead of stripping them of their knowledge of the end of days, of, of the apocalypse, he grants them that information. Because what it does is it gives humanity the knowledge, the absolute true and undeniable knowledge, that there is something out there greater than themselves. And it's only ever when humanity as a whole is presented with a threat that one person or one, one country or civilization cannot overcome on its own, that people usually work together in order to quell that threat. It may be a temporary thing, but what this means here is that in order for humanity to truly achieve great things, you have to have a coming together of civilization as a whole. Everyone who's alive here remembers the four horsemen walking the earth, right? They remember pestilence and death and famine and, and war walking the face of the planet. All the things they went through, they, they, they remember what it meant to die. They remember what it meant to become the soldiers of hell and the soldiers of heaven. They recall their experiences with 
with all of these things. And so what this means is that one, when Al Simmons is presented with the notion of, are you going to allow heaven and hell to still have access to this? He immediately says, no, heaven and hell basically are cut off to earth. They can never enter earth. They can never leave earth. They can have no involvement with humanity in any form or fashion. Following that, the question is, what are you going to do, right? Because at the moment, Spawn is God, right? That's what he is now. What are you going to do with all this power, Spawn? And that's when he says, I initially came back for Wanda, right? This is all going full circle. I came back for Wanda. I made that bargain with Malboja. I chose to be a hell spawn because I wanted to have Wanda back. I wanted her in my life and I would do whatever I needed to do in order to make that happen. And this is where things get kind of cool, right? This, see, this is how you tell the difference between a guy who can, who can like get done and a guy who's just like, man, I really hope things go my way. Spawn's just like, okay, so here's my situation. Right now, Wanda thought I was dead, but now she knows that I'm alive. But she married Terry after she believed that I was dead. And then like, they kind of did their whole thing together. So like, sorry about your luck, Terry. I'm taking my girl back. That's basically what this is. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I want to be reborn as Al Simmons because at the end of the day, Wanda loves Terry. Sure, she loves him, but she'll never love him as much as she loves me. So like, Mr. Steal Your Girl is back. I guess not really Steal Your Girl, Mr. Steal Your Girl back. You know, steal his girl back, I guess is what it is. But unless Spawn basically rolls up and says like, I'm going home, right? Like, I do not want this power of God. Take this away from me. I don't want to have anything to do with this. I just want to go back and be a normal man. Now, initially the mother of creation goes to kind of issue a warning, but Spawn is like, there is no more Spawn. I don't want to hear any anything about this i don't want to hear anything you have to say i am just gonna go home okay so we are covering the conclusion to uh spawn um, uh, spawn armageddon this is the very last thing and here's my question for you guys those of you guys who are are really knowledgeable about spawn where should we go from here you guys were the ones who told me to cover spawn armageddon and you guys proved to be right so i'm deferring to you guys again where do we jump to after this what do you think that we should cover but in any event with the main armageddon battle having happened right the end of god and satan and that kind of a thing them them doing you know whatever the case is one of the things to understand now is that we are basically on an alternate earth Earth is really kind of how this works, right? It's not really the recreated Earth. Earth as it originally existed has been essentially devoid of all life. It's been destroyed and God and Satan are fighting on that world forevermore. At this point, what we do is we switch to kind of this, this new Earth that's being created by Spawn and Al Simmons trying to return home. Now, if you guys recall in the last video, initially the mother of creation tried to stop him, but Al Simmons blew the mother of creation off and just kind of continued towards the house, at which point Al Simmons has stopped dead in his tracks. And the reason why is because the mother of creation basically says there's something that you have have to see and you know before you go in here before you reveal yourself to them there's something that you need to know and so what what the mother of creation does is kind of remove spawn from his physical form and give him somewhat of like an astral form but the initial kind of conversation going on between the simmons family with terry granny with cyan with uh, with wanda is they're really kind of recovering from everything right now remember a lot of what happened uh wanda and and terry don't really recall granny remembers all of it right because she died and she went to heaven and found out that god wasn't really god as she believed him to be and, and all that kind of stuff if you guys want to you guys want to get caught up make sure you check the uh the, the description for the playlist of spawn to get all the stuff right we're like five videos in there so it's not super complex or anything a good way to kind of cope with the quarantine <laughs> but nonetheless you know for for cyan she remembers a great deal of it and it's one of these things where she basically says i don't want to refer to like you know spawn or to to al simmons as the sad man anymore i'm going to call him al because that's his name and so it's, it's kind of a cool thing because granny kind of talks about what's going on and it's kind of you know from from wanda and terry they're just kind of like okay uh you need to go to sleep that kind of a thing it's not really dismissive so much as just kind of the belief that like granny's off her rocker and then you start to get into the meat and potatoes and the worst thing that spawn ever did and what this does is it initially picks up with terry and wanda going into the bedroom and then of course wanda initially tries to kind of initiate sexy time and terry's not really receptive to it and the reason why is because or i guess really it's, it's one of these things where their romantic life their love life is almost non-existent and the reason for this is because terry has like a lot of issues that he's struggling with at the moment one of the things we kind of find out here is that with al simmons return, Terry's been struggling with this, right? Because it's not enough that Al Simmons came back. Al Simmons came back and then basically saved all of existence, right? So it's like, if you were dating a girl and then she was like, well, you know, me and my ex broke up and then you meet her ex and her ex turns out to be Superman, right? Like that's kind of what this is to a degree. <laughs> and, and, and Terry is in a lot of ways kind of feeling emasculated by that. This is also compounded by the fact that when he sort of lashes out, Wanda's response is, you know, I love you with all my heart. You know, that's, that's never going to go away. I'm always going to love Al Simmons because he was a man that I 
I was married to, but you're who I'm with now. Suddenly we find out that what Terry's been doing has been snooping. And, and essentially Wanda has kind of kept this box of artifacts, this kind of box of things that belong to Al Simmons, right? Pictures, love letters, different things like that. And she looks at them almost every single day. She kind of kisses them and almost seems, you know, this from Terry's perspective, she misses Al Simmons so much and can't really let go. And so the, the way that Terry sees this is really from the perspective of Wanda is still in love with Al Simmons and that if Al Simmons comes back right now, immediately Terry's going to get the boot, right? And he even goes as far as to say, you've been a great friend. You helped me through some tough times, but you got to go because my man's back. That's kind of how he views all of this. And this is when we really get, we get the beans spilled on everything because when Wanda learns that Terry was snooping, she's like, so what are you going to do next? Are you going to hit me? And his response is, God, no, why would I ever do that? And she said, because Al Simmons did. And that's when you really learn the truth of what Al Simmons, that's not the worst thing he did, right? But that's when you learn the truth about Al Simmons. When we look at the character of Spawn, we always saw him as just a guy who was married to a great woman and he potentially had a great life. And then he was betrayed by his friend, Jason Wynn, his boss, Jason Wynn, and then ended up becoming a hell spawn and he could just never go back home, right? He seemed like a character who was in a tragic situation, a great guy in an incredibly tragic scenario. It is anything but that. What we end up learning is the first time that, that Al Simmons hit Wanda was when they were at a party, they had both been drinking, they came back and Al Simmons just always kind of had this thing for his boss, right? He always looked up to Jason Wynn, he always idolized him. And when Wanda wanted to initiate like, like you know, an intimate moment when she wanted to have sex, uh, Al Simmons just kind of said, no, I'm not really interested in that. And then she said, well, then let's get your boss and then we can do a threesome and maybe that'll get some wood in your pecker, right? And where she was joking, he lashes out and hits her. Following that, it happened at different points in time and for different reasons, right? Sometimes he choked her, sometimes he backhanded her, sometimes he hit her with a closed fist. And it was one of these things where she, she goes as far as to say, she never really understood why, you know, how it is that like women in abusive relationships don't just leave, right? Like, why don't they just walk away? What's so hard about that? Like your man hits you, you leave? It's not rocket science. And that's how she viewed it, right? Like, how come I can't do that? The reality was she was in love with him, you know? And it, if you really look into the psychology of that, there's a lot of women who give a lot of different reasons for why that happens, right? They feel like they can't do anything on their own. Like they've kind of been made to feel like, like they're inferior. They can't live without that person, whatever the case happens to be. But there's a lot of psychological effects that go into abusive relationships. And that's one of the things that happened here. Al Simmons would buy her like a puppy or something along those lines. But the reality of this is that Wanda looked at Al and realized that, that she was second best, that the love of his life was war. It was conflict. It was fighting things and killing people. That's the way it was, right? That's the thing that he cared about the most. And when she initially sat down and started having this conversation with him, and when she's talking to Terry, one of the things she says is there was a point where she became pregnant. And Al Simmons watching all this go down didn't know, but he had no idea that, that Wanda was pregnant. And essentially, you know, it's, it's kind of like we tried so many times, it wasn't really possible that Wanda had essentially gone off the pill. She had been on birth control all this time and Al Simmons didn't know. And so finally she goes off birth control and then basically decides, I want to get pregnant with this guy, right? And so following that, what this does is it turns into a thing where she starts talking to him about that. I went off the pill, I'm pregnant now, you know, that kind of a thing. And initially he's kind of upset about the fact that she made that choice without telling him. But what he basically says is like, there's a world out there. There's a dark and a cruel and a horrible world. And like, it's my job as the man on the wall to keep it at bay. I'm the only one that can keep this world safe. I'm the one that has to do these things, you know, so on and so forth. But it's this idea that like only he can protect the world, right? Only he can keep everything safe, right? He's the only guy capable of doing that. And that the reality of him is that there are two sides to Al Simmons. There's the family man, Al Simmons. Then there's just the murderous flipping a switch, doing whatever you need to do and removing the emotion from the equation kind of guy. And so the result of this is that he begins to kind of lash out, you know, for a moment when he looks at her, you know, she says he got this look, the look that people he's killed have probably seen on his face for the last time. What he does is he punches her in the gut and then basically forces her to miscarry. And that's the worst things Al Simmons, that's the worst thing Al Simmons did is he basically hit his wife. She miscarried and he killed his own baby. And it's extreme, right? It's, it's insane because it takes everything about Al Simmons that we knew and it totally flips it on its head, right? Totally changes everything up because he's no longer this guy who was just a really great guy in a bad situation. Al Simmons was a terrible human being. And that's one of these things where he doesn't believe any of what he's hearing. The whole idea behind Wanda was that when he went on this final mission where he ended up dying, of course, he didn't know that he was going to die and neither did she. The intention was that when he came back, she was going to leave him. She was going to, she was going to walk away. She's going to be like, we're done. Divorce him and then basically end up, end up leaving. But such as it was, Al Simmons ended up being killed and then basically became Spawn, which kind of solved the, solved the equation for her. Finding Terry was exactly what she needed, right? She needed a great man. She needed a man that, that she could kind of expose the worst parts of herself to and then still be accepted, right? Not be rebuked. That's what she needed was just a great man. And so following that, 
Al Simmons basically takes off and the mother of creation basically verifies all of this and says, this was all true. These are all memories that you suppressed. Everything that you heard from Wanda is true. I haven't manipulated reality. I haven't changed anything. I didn't trick you into hearing something that wasn't actually being said. That's true. Like this is your history. This is your past. You're not the man you think you are. When you died and then when you went to hell and you encountered Malboja, you chose to become a hell spawn because subconsciously you believed that you deserved to be punished for what it was that you'd done. That's why you chose to become spawn. And so at the end of the day, when spawns like, well, then kill me, like kill me and let this be done. The response of the mother of creation is no, this is your penance. This is the price you pay for the things that you've done. You have to redeem yourself. Now you are basically just kind of out there. Spawn is more or less in purgatory now, right? That's kind of how he is. He's not really in hell, but he's not really in heaven. He has to redeem himself and prove that he's a good guy in order to be able to get into heaven or whatever it is, the actual heaven that kind of exists out there where those who are good people go when they die, presumably the realm of the mother of creation. We're not really sure, but basically the, the mother of creation tells spawn, it's now time for you to go back home. And when spawn asks where that is, the mother of creation says, you know where that is right back down to the alleys again. It's amazing. Like it's, it's crazy, but this is, this is the darkest thing that spawn ever did. Spawn killed his own kid, right? He was so obsessed with the idea of the life that he saw for him. So I guess the life that he kind of went after violence, death, destruction, that it consumed him in its entirety and basically cost him his life and the life of his child. So with that being said, guys, we're going to bring this video to an end. If you are new here to comments, explain make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoy this video, make sure you drop a like and I will catch you all later. Peace.